I want to talk to you about being free from, free in, and free to. <laughs> free from, free in, and free to. Example. We can, of course, be free in relationships, free to praise and worship God, free in unpleasant circumstances, free while we are waiting to be free from unpleasant circumstances, free from allowing our emotions to control us, free from jealousy, free from self-pity, free from overeating, on and on and on. Here's an example. You can be free to confront and yet free to submit. Right, this half of the room is getting it better. You can be free to confront somebody that you feel like is controlling you, but you can also be free to submit to proper authority that God places over you. So the thing we can't do is just yell, well, I'm, I'm free. I'll do what I want to. I'm free. <laughs> Let me be clear. That is not freedom. That is stupidity. Nobody can do everything they want to do and expect to have any friends and a great life. Amen? You can be free to enjoy food and yet at the same time free from overeating. Now, you know, it's just a little bit silly for somebody that's born again and full of the Holy Spirit <laughs> to say, if I eat one cookie, I have to eat the whole bag. <laughs> if I eat one potato chip, I've got to eat the whole bag. I mean, did you even hear how silly that sounds? I mean, if you don't have authority over a cookie, or a potato chip, we are in serious trouble. Just saying. Now you're going to find out tonight that one of our biggest problems is wrong believing. Because <laughs> see, the truth is, is Jesus has already set us free from everything. But it's what we believe that determines how we're going to live. And so as long as you believe that you cannot just say no to cookies or eat one cookie or hey, if you eat one, you know, I get the taste of chocolate in my mouth. I have to eat the whole thing. You know? <laughs> if that's what you believe, then guess what? Be it unto you even as you believe. I've been thinking about scripture a lot this week, just thinking about some different circumstances and situations that I'm aware of, and I'll, I'll tell you the truth. What we believe is just extremely important, and you know, you can adjust your thinking just a little bit, and it can make a major change in your life. Just by adjusting how you think just a little tiny bit. See, I've, I, for years, I believed the lie that I could never get over my past. My dad had abused me sexually, and my mom didn't know how to help me. She was afraid of him, so she didn't. I married the first guy that came along. He mistreated me even more. It was just one nightmare after another. And so, I mean, I, I thought I would always, I believe this, I believe that I would always have a second-rate life because of what had happened to me. I believed that I would never be okay. Well, guess what? I believed I would never get over it. So you know what? I wasn't getting over it. But when I learned to believe the word more than I believed what I felt or what I saw or what other people told me, when I started saying, I didn't get a good start, but I'm going to have a good finish. When I started saying, God can take all that mess and actually work something good out of it and make me a better person than I would have been if it wouldn't have happened. See, then it started happening. But you have to learn to believe. Come on, believe. Believe. What do you believe? What do you believe? You believe people don't like you? They're not going to like you. 
I'm just goofy. I believe everybody loves me. And you know, the letters that we get from people telling me they don't, they don't give them to me anyway, so you're wasting your time. Because my folks protect me. Amen. So I just live in this dream world. You know what? Haters are going to hate and complainers are going to complain. So Free to spend money and yet free from being in bondage to debt. Free to speak boldly and plainly and yet free from being ill-mannered and rude. I'm telling you people, and I was like this for years. I mean, I was always saying things to people I shouldn't say and hurting people's feelings. And I'd be, well, that's just, that's just the way I am. It's just my personality. I'm just a straightforward person. Well, you know what? You can, you can be a straightforward person and still do it in love. You see, the thing is, is love has to trump everything. I mean, that, that's like the thing. Everything has got to come back to love. Otherwise, there is no such thing as being free if we're not free to do the thing that will be a blessing to people. We can't just be free to do what we want to do all the time. We, ha we have to be free to say, well, I know that I'm free to do that, but I'm going to choose not to do that because I believe doing that would hurt you. Now, we got a real mess going on in the world today with my rights and my freedoms. I mean, even the freedom of speech is carried to such a ridiculous extreme that it just is unbelievable. First of all, the laws that we have were all written based on the Word of God. Now, they're not being interpreted that way now, but they were written based on the Word of God. And so people today want to be free, but what's happening is they're more than happy to take away your freedom to have theirs. And they don't care who they hurt as long as they get what they want. And you can't do that. Freedom is a privilege, but it's also a huge responsibility. The freer you are, the greater your responsibility is. I'm free to do anything and say anything I want to in this place tonight. Because right now, for this moment, I'm in charge. But that doesn't make me feel like a big shot or powerful, it scares me. You know why? Because I answer to God, and so I cannot just do anything I want to do. Not if I want to keep my job. Because God is good at firing people. Hey, you think you, you, think you got a tough boss? Hmm. <laughs> How many of you understand me? You can't. Love has to be the main goal in everything. We're free to dream great dreams for our futures, but we're also free to be patient while we're waiting. We're free to be all we can be. We're free to enjoy ourselves while we're changing. We're free to be ourselves and yet realizing that we constantly still need to be changing. <laughs> well, this is just the way I am. Well, compare it to what's in here. And if it's not what's in here, then while you're enjoying being yourself where you're at, keep asking God to change you. We're free from guilt and condemnation, but we're also free to still be very sensitive to letting the Holy Spirit touch us when we do anything wrong. See, I know people that have gotten so good that there's no condemnation that they don't even seem to notice it anymore when they sin. And that's a problem. I mean, we need to know it right away in the pit of our gut when we do something that displeases God, and we need to repent and receive forgiveness. And then there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We don't have to live under condemnation, but we do need to be sensitive 
to bad behavior. Otherwise, we will not walk in love because we'll go around hurting people all the time. Now here we're going to dive off the deep end and see what you guys can take. Romans 6, 6, and 7. We know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil and that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. Now, it doesn't say you'll never sin. It says that you will no longer be a slave to sin. In other words... We should be at a point in our life where we can say, or at least we need to be heading toward this point, there is nothing in my life that controls me. There is nothing in my life that controls me except the Holy Spirit. Amen? You say, well, I sure wish I was free from sin. Well, you know what? You're never going to be until you first start believing that you are. <laughs> That's okay. We'll go slow. I get it. Well, if I'm not, how can I be? It says I am, but are you sure I am? Yes, you have it. If you have it legally. Jesus died to set you free from sin, but experientially now, after you believe that you have it, experientially, as you walk with God, you'll manifest it little by little by little as you grow in him. You'll, you'll change. There will be some things in your life that will change from being here this, these next three days or two days or one tonight or however often you get to come. There will be things that will change, but it won't be the last thing that will change. There will be other things that will need to change. We're always growing in him, but still you have been set free and I have been set free. Every born again person on the planet has been legally by the blood of Christ set free from bondage to sin. Now we're going to look at something that I think is interesting. Romans 7, 15. We're going to look at Paul's very confusing discourse here about the thing I want to do, I can't do the thing I don't know, I always want to do. I read that and I think, yeah, Paul, what is wrong with you? But it kind of makes me feel good when I read it because I think somebody else feels like me. Now, I'll make a statement first. If you said to me, Joyce, tell me how I can live the Christian life. How many of you would like it if I could just put it into one thing for you and say, I'm going to tell you how you can live the Christian life. Would you like that? Let me see. You'd like that? She's, she's like me, me, me. She's talking to me too. How about over, anybody over here? You'd like that? Okay. All right. Well, here's my great theological answer. You cannot live the Christian life. What kind of stupid teaching is this? Yeah, you can't live the Christian life. Just now, I'm just going to let you sit there a while and wonder what I'm doing, and then I'll show you. Romans 7 15. I don't understand my own actions. I am baffled, bewildered. I'm going to read this whole thing, so just. I don't practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. Now, if I do habitually what is contrary to my desire, that means I acknowledge and agree that the law is good, morally excellent, and that I take sides with it. However, it's no longer I who does the deed, but the sin principle which is at home in me and has possession of me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention and the urge to do what is right, but no power to carry it out. <laughs> For I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I'm ever doing. Anybody relating to Paul here? Come on. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, then it's, it's no longer me doing it. I used to think, well, then who is it? I mean, he would lose me here. And so it's not myself that acts, but the sin principle which dwells within me fixed and operating in my soul. So I find it to be a law and a rule of action of my being that when I want to do what is right and good, evil is ever present with me, making me subject to its insistent demands. For I endorse and delight in God, in the law of God, in my inmost self with my new nature. 
We're getting there. But I discern in my bodily members and the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh a different law or rule of action at war against the law of my mind, my reason, making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs and the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. 24. Oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am. <laughs> will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death. Now, don't go to verse 25 on the screen. All right. Now, <laughs> I just saw something. Well, I mean, I've known this in different ways, but I was reading that a week or so ago, and I've done some theological checking with my professor friend who knows more of the theology than me to make sure I'm not crazy. But in 10 verses, Paul uses the word I 25 times. And he's very right. I cannot do it. And neither can you. Now, people have wondered, what is Paul talking about there? And there's actually been a lot of theological debates over the centuries about what is he talking about. Is he talking about himself before he was born again? Is he talking about himself after he was born again, but when he was still struggling with some of the things that we struggle with? Or was Paul already completely free, but he was just doing this whole thing to kind of help other people that were going through things? And I'll be honest, I don't know that that matters that much to me because I think the principle is clear. Paul is coming to the point where he's saying, I mean, if I went through, I went through and I circled every place where he said I. Now, I've got an amplified Bible, so there's even more in that one than there is in the other ones. <laughs> 25 times in 10 verses, I try to do this, and I try to do that, and I can't, and I fail, and I want to, and I, 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 I. Now, verse 25. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thank God he will. Oh, thank God he will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I of myself with my mind and heart serve the law of God, but with my flesh I will serve the law of sin. So he's saying if I can learn to walk in the Spirit with God's help, the power of the Holy Spirit, I can't do it myself. I cannot do it by myself. You cannot live the Christian life. I cannot live the Christian life. But he will live it through us if we trust him all the time to do through us what we cannot do on our own. Amen. So see, it, if we're not careful, you'll hear my series on freedom and go home and try to be free. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to try to be free. You know, we, we skip the important parts. I, for years, I went to church and heard messages, and every message I heard, I needed it. Every message. And then I would go home and try to do it. I would try to keep my mouth shut. I would try. And you know, it was weird because when I got quiet for very long, I got depressed. I did. I started feeling really down. And I didn't understand. It's like I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be quiet, like, like the Bible says, and like they said in church on Sunday. So if I'm doing the right thing, why do I feel so down? And you know what God had to show me? I'm so glad I got all this stuff from God. He said, well, you've shut your mouth, but nothing has changed on the inside. And so, yeah, I was getting depressed because now it was like a pressure cooker. I wasn't letting any of it out. It was all in there just eating away at me. See, that's why we need him all the time, because there has to be an inward work before there will be outward fruit. You say, well, then what am I supposed to do? All right, I'll give you an example, and I still do this. The other day, somebody said something to me that hurt my feelings, and I could feel offense. And it's somebody that's done it more than once, so, you know, you get a little bit more touchy when you have to keep forgiving the same person over and over. It's like, really, God, could we just 
change this person a little more quickly here, please. And, uh, but see, I, I know better. I know better. I cannot be in strife. I cannot be in unforgiveness. I cannot stay angry. I cannot. I will not. But I still felt that way, so I know what to do, and I, I'm going to tell you what to do. You go to the Word, and you look up scriptures that you know about anger, about strife, about peace, and you prayerfully read them. What I mean by that is you read, you talk to God about it. I mean, I, I'll just say to the Lord, Lord, we need to have a conversation about this. We got to talk about this because now my feelings are hurt and I, I can't stay mad. So you've got to help me get over this. You know, you might get more help from God if you would quit trying to be so spooky religious every time you go to him. I mean, people change their voice tone. They change their, they go to Elizabethan English. Oh, thou most holiest, most wonderfulest. I just said, Lord, I am mad, and we need to have a conversation, because I can't stay mad. I've got to have peace. And you know what? It wasn't very long at all. I mean, maybe it took me two hours to work through the whole thing, and I would feel better, and then maybe I'd start to think about it again a little. You know how it is. You'll start to think about it, and then it'll all come back again, you know? And so... Well, we learn. You learn things. You just go get your mind on something else. Do something else. I'm not, I'm not wasting my day on something that has already happened and I can't do anything about it. See, if you will put your little holy foot down and say, devil, you are not going to do this to me. But you can't do it without God. I don't care if I have to say that nine million times tonight. You cannot do it without God. You can't do it. So I'm just telling you, you cannot get, live the Christian life. So if you're trying to live the Christian life, you might as well just figure out it's got to be Christ in you, Christ through you. He has to get the credit. He has to get the glory. Now, if you would go back and read that in the context, which I'm not going to take the time to go through the whole thing again, but we can clearly see he's saying, I try to do this and I can't do that. And I, 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 and I. He throws in one me in there, but I think it's like the same thing. And then he says, oh, what a mess I'm in. Who is going to help me? Who will deliver me? Oh, exclamation mark in the Bible. Thank God he will through Jesus Christ. Then the next verse says, and there is therefore now, while he's changing me, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for the law of the spirit of death, the law of the legal code, is dead and the law the law the spirit that's now in me has set me free from that law of sin and death now when I lean over the pulpit that this is my motherly look this is my very best you know how your mom used to look at you it was like please don't just accept the wife of just struggling and frustration and always trying to fix something that only God can fix. Now I'm going to say something that maybe I shouldn't say, but I must say it anyway. <laughs> now you'll be okay. You'll understand. Um, now, obviously, we need to take sin very seriously. Let me preempt what I'm going to say with that. But I think sometimes we worry about some stuff too much. It's like I get up every day and I tell you, I would love to be perfect every day. I mean, I would love to just do every single thing 100% right that God wants me to do. And that's my plan when I get up. It don't last long, but that's my plan. How many of you know we're gonna all going to be really holy till we get out of bed? And that's just about as long as it lasts. But see, God sees your heart. He sees
says that you want to. And I can tell you right now, your want to, your heart motivation is really more important to God than whether or not you make a little mistake here and there. And as soon as I do something wrong and God convicts me, I'm all over it. I'm sorry. I'm not messing around with it. I don't want to be like that. I want to grow. I want to change. But I tell you what, I suffered with guilt and condemnation for so many years of my life. I mean, I say this and everybody laughs, but it's true. I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. I mean, I just, I mean, I was just so used to feeling bad about myself and wrong about myself and like God was probably a little bit halfway mad at me all the time that I just, when I started finally feeling a little bit good, I thought, well, this has got to be sin. You got to feel bad. I mean, good Christians feel bad. Oh, poor wretched man that I am. So let me read you 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I write you these things so that you may not violate God's law and sin. So John is saying, look, I'm writing all this to you so you don't sin. That's the point of the whole book. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, one who will intercede for us with the Father. And it is Jesus Christ, the all-righteous, upright, just, who conforms to the Father's will in every purpose, thought, and action. So I can't conform... But I'm in somebody who already has, and that somebody is also in me. Amen? I know it takes a while. You're like, see, and really the people clapping, you kind of already know this, and you're just excited because now you're hearing it again. But people that are going, I'll tell you the absolute truth, and I know exactly what you're saying. Like, I was petrified to believe this. I was petrified to believe that if I did something wrong, that I could just ask God to forgive me and just go on, that I didn't have to persecute myself feeling guilty for two days or three days or whatever. And I tell you what, I do not. That is one thing that I do not waste my time with anymore because I can tell you it does absolutely nothing but keep you trapped in sin. Amen. Now, I might be sorry for a long time, but I don't feel guilty. There's a difference. I don't ever want to disappoint God. I want to do what he wants me to do all the time. And you know, a lot of times people are afraid to preach this kind of freedom to people because they think, well, you're just giving people a license to sin. Well, you know what? I highly doubt that if you were just looking for a way to sin and get by with it, I really doubt you would have come to this conference tonight. Because I think you already know that's not your, what you're getting out of me. Amen? And nobody would take off work and travel. And I mean, some of you paid money. You traveled. You stayed in hotels. And you didn't do it because you're looking for an excuse to sin. You want to be the person that God wants you to be. And I'm here to tell you that God sees your heart. And this is my feeling. I think that God would rather have somebody with a really good heart who makes a mistake once in a while than somebody who's got their act perfected, but they have a lousy heart. Amen. First John 1, 9, if we freely admit that we've sinned, and if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, true to his own nature, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and I like this in the Amplified, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I guess if he's continuously cleansing me, then I must continuously need it. And the Bible says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, continuously interceding for us. So I guess I continually need him to pray for me. All right. Freedom's a wonderful thing, but at the same time, it is a huge responsibility. How many of you agree with that? Freedom not only says I can do whatever I desire, but it says I must take responsibility for my actions. And that's the big thing that's missing in our society today. We have so many people that think they're entitled to stuff. 
I mean, people want to come to work for you now and start where it used to take people 30 years to get to. And I'm not saying everybody's like this, but there's a lot of people in the world today, they don't want to earn anything. They want to be given everything. And can I tell you a secret? I do not believe if stuff is just handed to you that you can ever really appreciate what you have. I don't think you can. I just, I don't know that you can really appreciate what God does for you if you've never had to ever have to want something or wait a while to get it or do your part to get it. It's just not God's way. Man, if you knew how long I preached and taught people and had such deep financial needs and never got any money for it, and now you can't even hardly get anybody to volunteer for anything. You should see what we have to go through to get volunteers for our conferences. I mean, sometimes we'll have to contact 5,000 people to get 100 to show up. It's like, you know, we need to realize that we don't have to be paid for every move that we make. We need to learn how to serve and give and be a blessing and do it unto the Lord. And I do appreciate all the people that do volunteer in our meetings because you can't really have a good meeting without people to keep things in order. So freedom not only says I can do whatever I want to do, but it also says I'm willing to take responsibility for my actions. Now, 1 Peter 2, 16. Live as free people, yet without employing your freedom as an excuse for sin. Don't you love that? Now, Peter's saying, look, you're, you're free. We, we teach you that you're free. Jesus came to set you free. Now, go out and live as free people, but don't use your freedom as an excuse to sin and mistreat other people. Love trumps everything. Now, I want to take the rest of the time we have, and I want to talk to you about freedom in one area, freedom from struggling. If I would have walked around this room tonight with a microphone before I got started and said, tell me what you're struggling with. Most of you could have come up with something just like that. Struggling with my husband, struggling with my wife, struggling with one of my kids, struggling financially, struggling with my weight, you know, struggling with my job, you know, all right, struggle, struggle, struggle. And we're not supposed to do that. Jesus didn't die. So we could be tied up in knots and struggle all the time and always be wrestling with something. The only thing, the only antidote for struggle is believing. <laughs> believing. Because believing is what causes us to enter the rest of God. And the rest of God is that place we're talking about tonight where you're free and you're, you're not constrained and you're not worried. You're, you're, you're enjoying your life. You're, you care about other people. The thing that causes us to struggle is trying to do something ourselves without believing or instead of believing God. Don't try to do anything that you don't ask God to help you with. The most frequent prayer that we should all pray is God help me. <laughs> and we probably need to just, I mean, I don't know, we, we probably shouldn't be able to count how many times a day. Our heart goes up to God asking him to help us. I hope you don't think that I ever come out here without asking God to help me because I certainly do not. And if I ever did, I would hope he would kick me right off the platform. And I have preached enough times that you would probably think that I could certainly be able to come out and do it and pull it off.
I'll tell you what, I'm not interested in pulling anything off. I want God's anointing on what I say. And you don't get that if you don't get God involved. Struggle just makes you miserable. When you're struggling, you're trying to make something happen that's just not happening. <laughs> How many years did I try to change myself and try to change Dave, change my kids? I hated all the sports that Dave loves. And in January, we'll be married 50 years, and he still loves them, and he's added some. I mean, now he, he, he just... Now he sits and watches tennis all the time. He's never played tennis in his life. <laughs> he, so he just keeps adding them. I, literally, if it rolls or bounces, Dave likes it. And, um, and I'm good with it. It's like, I don't care. You do what you want. I'll do what I want. See you for dinner. <laughs> See you in the morning, whatever, you know. You know why? Can I tell you? Now listen to me. A life is not worth living if you're going to be in knots and upset and struggling with something all the time. Now when I lean over the pulpit, that this is my motherly look. This is my very best. You know how your mom used to look at you? It was like, Please don't just accept a life of just struggling and frustration and always trying to fix something that only God can fix. There's nothing worse than trying to do something that only God can do. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and the bottom line is, is if God doesn't do it, you sure can't. Now, if God gives you something to do, do it. But the whole thing is, is when God does assign you something to do, he will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. And so even then, it won't have to be a struggle. I work hard at what I do, but I do not struggle doing it. Not now. I used to years ago. If I wouldn't have got over the stress I felt, I would have been dead a long time ago. You need to enjoy your life. How many of you have been struggling with some other person? <laughs> How many of you have kids that just drive you crazy? <laughs> you know what? I had four kids that I thought, I mean, three of the four I thought would kill me. <laughs> and I was sure they'd never be able to leave the house that they could not take care of themselves, that they couldn't find anything that they belonged to them. <laughs> My youngest son, who's now 36, I thought for sure I'd be taking care of him the rest of his life. I mean, it, it was so hard to get that kid through school. And now he's the CEO of our ministry. It is just so funny. And the one daughter that couldn't keep up with anything she owned, now... I pay her myself personally to help me keep my life in order. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You're worrying about stuff that you can't do anything about. And if you pray instead of worrying, you will be amazed at how God will take care of that stuff. Just listen to me. There's one thing about getting older, folks. You know more. And we all say, oh, if I could just be young again and know what I know now. <laughs> well, it don't happen that way. But one of the things you can do is maybe share what you've learned with somebody else and they maybe won't listen. I don't know, but you can try anyway. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 10 and 11. He who has once entered God's rest has ceased from the weariness and the pain of human labors. Wow. Just as God rested from those labors, peculiarly his own. Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter the rest of God. He's like, okay, if you're going to struggle with anything, do your very best to learn how to rest in God.
and experience it for yourselves so that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience that they had in the wilderness. So, believing leads you into the rest of God. Believing means to be persuaded or to have confidence. Now, let me share something with you that I think is just beautiful. The word believe is such an important word in the Bible. And um, it's similar to faith, but they have a little, couple little different actions. You know, faith is something that God gives us. God gives to every man the measure of faith. I, and so we have faith. We have to choose to use it. But believing is something that we choose, and it, and it involves a lot of our thinking. What we, how we decide that we're going to look at things and what am I going to believe about that situation? Just like believing the best of every person. When I was trying to get over that offense last week, one of the things I did was I said, God, I will choose to believe the best. Well, that was not something God downloaded into me. I chose to believe the best because his word says that's what we're supposed to do. And I know that if I believe the worst of people and I'm suspicious, I'm going to be tormented. But if I believe the best, even if their intention was wrong, if I believe the best, I'm going to be happy. So you can do yourself a big favor tonight if you'll just decide that you're going to just tweak your believing just a little bit. <laughs> I just want to give your believing a little adjustment tonight. Amen? Can anybody think of somewhere where your believing could just use a little... Just a little bit of an adjustment. Okay, now listen. The word believe is used in... Most frequently in the Gospels, and most frequently in the Gospel of John, Matthew uses the verb believe ten times, Mark uses it ten times, Luke uses it nine times, and the Apostle John uses the word believe 99 times. 99 times. Now, interestingly enough, He's the one who was always fellowshipping with Jesus, hanging out with Jesus, had his head on Jesus' chest, called himself, said this in the book he wrote about himself, I, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. <laughs> now you talk about some bold confidence. If I put out a book like that, I mean, David had confidence too. He referred to himself all the time as the Lord's anointed. What would happen if I came out at night and said, I am the Lord's anointed, the disciple whom Jesus loves? I mean, you would have all been ready to stone me and go home. But they had confidence. And you know where you get that kind of confidence? Fellowshipping with God. Hanging out with God, not trying to keep all the rules and regulations, but trusting him to do something good through you. The choice I have to try. I'm not telling you that there's not an effort that we put out, but there's, an, there's a difference in a fleshly effort and an effort made in the Holy Spirit. And see, when you start to struggle or to feel frustrated, you might as well know right now you're into works of the flesh. You've left grace and you're into works of the flesh. Now you're trying to do it yourself. You're back into the I, 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 I. 99 times. They couldn't even kill him. They tried to boil him in oil and they couldn't kill him. And that's, that's a historical fact. They could not kill him. Now, interestingly enough, we, usually in life, we hear more about the doers than we do the believers. Peter, and I'm not saying he wasn't a believer, he certainly was, but Peter was more of a doer. He's going to do it. And I, this is just my own opinion. Don't have a scripture for it, but I think that John probably annoyed the daylights out of Peter.
I, he's probably like, will you just do something? You know, I was always a doer, and Dave was more of a believer. And interestingly enough, you've probably heard a lot more about me than Dave, but I was the one that was struggling, and Dave was at rest and peace. Well, bless God, I take care of everything in this family. I was always running around trying to fix everything, and Dave is just believing God. Peter had the most dominant personality. I wrote this down. This is good. Peter had the most dominant personality, but John had the most intimate relationship. Amen. You got to be careful about those quiet ones. I'm telling you, just because you're loud and got something to say all the time don't mean you got something the little quiet guy doesn't have. He may have something going on between him and Jesus that you couldn't even possibly imagine. And I love this joy and peace are found in believing Hallelujah. Romans 15 13 may the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing to the experience of your faith that the power of the Holy Spirit that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound and be overflowing with hope well let me close with just a few statements what should you believe what would I suggest to you that that you believe one, believe that God is good. All the time, God is good all the time. No matter what kind of lousy thing is going on in your life right now, God is good. And believe that it will ultimately work out. It'll work out. Your kids will grow up. More than likely, they're going to be okay. I can't say that nobody ever continues to have problems in their life, but... All of mine have turned out really good, and I tell you what, I would just, I was sure wondering. <laughs> Amen? Believe that God is greater than your problems, and that with Him, nothing is impossible. <laughs> Believe that your breakthrough is going to manifest at any moment. that you hear from God don't ever say again I wish I could hear from God do not ever say that you say I hear from God I am led by the Holy Spirit remember you're gonna get what you believe believe that God has heard your prayers and be expecting his answer just a few more believe that God's healing power is working in your body and that every day you're gonna feel better and better in every way Believe God gives you favor everywhere that you go and that you don't have to work at being accepted by people. Let God give you favor. Believe that God is working in your life, in you, in your loved ones, and you are changing all the time and getting better and better and better. And the last thing I want to say is believe, believe, believe. Amen. Well, you can be free from struggling, but you can't do it on your own. True freedom only comes from studying the Word of God and having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, we're offering you four CDs called Living a Life of Total Freedom. Now, I don't know if there's any area of bondage in your life, but most of us have got an issue with something. And I believe that Jesus died so we could be free and have a wonderful life that we really enjoy. So I think these teachings are really going to help you. And today we're offering these teachings for your gift to the ministry of any amount. We feel like it's a very important area, and we believe that it's going to be a real relief for you to be able to trust God and so we want you to have this today for your gift to the ministry of any amount. All we ask is that you do your best. Some of you who can do more should do that to maybe help make up for some of those who can't do as much. Get some word, get it in you, go forward.